So the first person that's going to be welcoming you is the president of the California Teachers Association, uh, Dean Vogel, uh, who has been uh, very instrumentally involved in um, this particular project, as well as many projects that are going to be impacting the student center focus of the CTA's uh, strategic plan. So he's going to talk to you about uh, the CTA involvement, what the project means to us. Dean? And fold down and the person who's running the laptop thing is saying, oh my god, they just erased my whole program. Maybe not. Hi. How are you? Let me tell you, I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here. Now think about it, we're in the CTA headquarters. Okay, now, I'm just kind of wondering. How long can you go up there? Thanksgiving holiday just happened. And so those of you sitting here are classroom teachers uh, and not in your classroom, uh, incredible kudos for giving that up because that's a tough thing not being in your classroom. And for those folks out uh, in their school building and wherever they're watching this, they're still feeling that same thing. We don't like being away from our kids. Well, I thought I'd just turn it I love that. Now it's turned on. Can you hear me back there? Yeah. <laughs> so anyway. This convening about the Instructional Leadership Core project, I think may be the first time we've had administrators, union leaders, instructional leaders, building level folks, teachers, educators of all sorts, all together in this room focused on one thing, and that's to support our next generation of students as they move through this common core. The goal of the ILC is to enrich instruction and to foster deeper student learning. But of course, we all know that. That's why we're here. That's what we do day in and day out. We can reclaim our role in designing and developing effective learning methods for each other and for our students. I mean, how often have we been sitting with our friends saying things like, I wish I had more of a voice in what's happening. I wish people would listen to the voice of my colleagues as they're anticipating what we should be doing in classrooms and getting ready to talk to us about it. You know, this project is the first large-scale project of its kind. We've got 184 classroom teachers, site-based leaders, administrators. That's you all. And those of you at home. And we've come together to provide professional learning opportunities and expertise to educators statewide. It's a very big deal. And you're a very diverse group. And not just ethnically, but demographically, geographically. You come from urbans and rurals and suburbans. You come from the far reaches of the state and you come from the center of the population. You come from low-income schools and affluent schools. You represent all of the grade levels. You represent every way we can think about diversifying a population. You represent that group, as well as subject areas, content areas, ELD, special ed, everything. And you're also equally distributed among the, CTA, uh, the four CTA regions with roughly 45 uh, members from each region. This groundbreaking partnership with Stanford's Center for Opportunity Policy and Development, SCOPE, and the National Board Research Center is about the collaboration among stakeholders. How often have we been saying that as educational leaders in our communities that if you really want to get the best done with the best effort, bring all of the folks together. Put all of the right voices around the table and let us talk to one another and with one another about where we want to go. Seems like we've been saying that for a long time and all of a sudden here we are realizing that in this uh, project. Everyone in this room, all of us, have a professional responsibility to drive this collaborative agenda because at the end of the day, what it really gets down to 
is we have the opportunity for improving teacher quality and building better learning environments for our kids. I don't know how many times I've said it. My primary responsibility as a union leader is to build and sustain quality learning environments for kids. And I know that that's what you say as well. That's what we're about and it's why we're here. Over the next three years, the goal of this project is to give all educational professionals more say. More say in their professional support, more say in how we go about increasing student learning. And CTA's involvement and commitment in this project focuses on two of the organization's strategic goals. Advocating on education reform. Think about that for a minute. That's all around shifting this social narrative, shifting it moving it to where we really need it to be. And that's toward a more student-centered uh, approach, to more, a more teacher-driven student-centered approach. And then number two, transforming our profession, establishing the highest standards of quality, not only in student-centered education, but also in developing teacher quality and in developing the capacity of educators. That's why CTA is teaming up with SCOPE that's why CTA is teaming with the National Board Research Center to do this work. It's important work. It's critical work. And it's about our students. After you hear more about the ILC project, I hope that we all leave here more committed to supporting student-centered activity, a student-centered agenda. I look forward to working with you on this collaborative effort because I'll tell you, it's our time. The whole rest of the country is watching California right now. They've been doing that for a couple years, and we are right at the uh, tip of the iceberg. Everybody's wanting to know where are we going next. Well, I'll tell you, it's our time. It's our time to engage students to become successful in career or college. It's our time to drive the educational agenda in California. It's our time to transform our profession with teachers supporting each other, not only for their own successes, not only for our own successes, but for the successes of our students. And it begins with projects like this Instructional Leadership core. You folks are right at the center of this phenomenal project. And where we're headed is really beyond belief. Think about it. You start with 184 people and pretty soon you're two or 300 and pretty soon you're two or 3,000 and pretty soon most of the folks understand what we're doing. That's where we're headed. And like I said when I started, thank you so much for giving up the day to be here. For those of you trying to find some time at lunch to be here as well, thank you and let's get on with it. Oh, my favorite part. I don't know how long I've known Linda, but I'll tell you, it's been a long time. And, uh, and uh, probably every time we get together, we learn a little bit more, not only about each other, but about the work that we're trying to get done. There's probably no more steadfast champion for teacher-driven, student-centered work than Linda Darlingham. And please, give it up for Linda. up here. I am delighted to be here on behalf of the Stanford part of this partnership uh, to launch what I think is a red letter day for instructional improvement in California, uh, both with respect to the new standards that we are working on and also with respect to the rebirth of high quality professional development that is job embedded, that is educator led, that is sustained and 
uh, long-lasting, of a kind that we have not experienced in this state for well over a decade in many parts of the state. So I um, am thrilled about uh, the, the launch of this project. Um, as you all know, that California has made a strong commitment to Common Core State Standards and Next Generation Science Standards. The new standards and the accompanying assessments do represent a significant paradigm shift in what students are expected to know and be able to do. Uh, they're ambitious. They represent goals for deeper learning of subject matter, as well as critical thinking, problem solving, collaboration, effective communication, self-directed learning, <clears throat> development of an academic mindset. Uh, they are not only big shifts in expectations for student learning, they are also big shifts in the expectations for instructional practice. Now, many teachers have been practicing in these ways for a long time, uh, but trying to work around the edges of uh, the standards and assessments that we um, had that were not particularly focused in that direction. And so this is a very important uh, and challenging undertaking. Uh, the, it, the kind of pedagogy that it calls for, um, shifting from transmission of the teaching of a set of facts and algorithms to a mix of guided um, inquiry and strategic instruction around big ideas and processes of investigation for students and so on, uh, is going to not be something that we can do with uh, a single drive-by, spray-and-pray you know, workshop of the sort that we've seen in the professional development uh, landscape um, in many cases. It's going to be a long, sustained uh, process of uh, educators uh, working together um, around these very challenging uh, goals. And uh, it will be worth the work that we put into it. Uh, one of the things that I think in, here in Silicon Valley is so obvious is that the nature of knowledge is changing. And as a Stanford professor, I don't usually like to quote my colleagues from Cal Berkeley. And I'm sure there's somebody from Cal in the room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But there are a couple of professors over there that have been uh, measuring the growth of knowledge in the world. And between 1999 and 2003, there was more new knowledge created in the world than in the entire history of the world preceding. Think about that for a moment. At that time, technology knowledge was doubling every two years. Now, it's doubling every year. And probably by the time I finish this sentence, it'll be doubling every six months. Um, so it's not impossible to take the curriculum, divide it up into a set of facts that we will deliver to kids in the 12 years of schooling and say, you're baked and you're done, go out and have a life. Because much of what they will need to be able to do is to learn to learn. They're going to have to be able to find information, weigh and balance evidence, figure out what it means, and so on. The vice president of Google was recently quoted, who, the person in charge of hiring, as saying they pay no attention to the test scores that people bring with them from wherever they're coming because they have no uh, real traction on what Google is looking for, which is learning ability, the ability to learn new things at all times. So uh, the Instructional Leadership core is going to support this kind of work in schools and for its members uh, and for all of the people that it touches. Uh, the uh, board certified teachers who are part of the National Board Resource Center at Stanford, uh, the accomplished professionals who come through other uh, avenues of CTA, the site-based leaders, the superintendents who are part of this, this work, um, will all be uh, designing professional learning that can be planted uh, with uh, on-the-job work uh, efforts to develop jointly lessons and units, to share those, to have teachers work with the ideas, come back, polish their lessons, uh, in the way that we often hear about Asian uh, countries having uh, lesson study and action research about practice, where you're fine tuning and developing these polished stones. Teachers will have the opportunity to learn with, uh, with and from other teachers. Uh, schools will have the opportunity to learn with and from other schools. Districts will have the opportunity to learn with and from other districts around the state as we deepen this year by year by year. The approach taken by the ILC is noteworthy for several reasons. Uh, the scale of the project, 
Uh, it will aim to serve uh, 8,000 teachers and 900 administrators across the state of California this school year and more than 50,000 educators within three years. Uh, the approach to professional development, which I said is going to be very much rooted in the uh, expertise of the participants and the demands and needs of their schools. So if you're in a school where 85% you know, of the students are English learners, uh, you will take up the English language arts, uh, common core standards, and English language development standards in a way that is very purposeful around the needs of your learners. Uh, and if you are in a different kind of setting, you will start where the kids are. The involvement of site-based leaders in the project and the focus on developing local capacity around the state. This will not go away when the vendor leaves. Uh, this will be planted and grow for years to come. Uh, I just want to say a word about what the teachers who came and the site leaders who came for the training in um, October said about the launch of the project. Um, things like um, fantastic, the support from fellow teachers is excellent, the idea of developing teacher leaders to uh, work with other teachers, I always get the most learning from other teachers uh, who are actually in classrooms. Uh, an amazing opportunity to network, learn, learn, plan, and prepare to execute credible professional development for our own colleagues. I feel empowered to re reclaim my navigation of how to teach while sharing it with other educators. And my favorite comment, it's like an ever unfolding flower or a metamorphosizing butterfly. So this is what we are beginning with. Uh, we hope that uh, superintendents, uh, school-based principals and other leaders, teacher leaders um, throughout the profession will be thinking about how to adopt and integrate the work that will be uh, the result of the expertise that these leaders are developing, uh, build a new instructional vision and capacity uh, by collaborating across classrooms and buildings and regions of the state. And uh, in a few moments, you'll hear from Marlene and Ann Jaquith, who will tell you more about the specifics of how to get connected to and involved in this work. Thank you. There you are. <laughs> Shall I give this to Ann? Yes. So I think the important thing right now is we we have lots of people here in the audience, and you haven't had a chance to talk with each other unless you know you purposely went up and introduced yourself. So I just kind of uh, like to get an idea of who's in the room. So let me just start with the uh, union presidents. How many of you are union presidents? So we welcome you here. You're very familiar with the building. Um, how many of you? Um, our CTA staff, so welcome CTA staff, um, superintendents, assistant superintendents at the district level, and then our site administrators, the site principal, vice principals, designees. So we welcome you all. Um, and l like Dean said, this is a quite, um, quite an opportunity to bring all of you together as well as those of you that are in the audience virtually. Uh, we know that there's quite a mix of people attending. They just couldn't travel because uh, it's the first day of school uh, back for many of them. And uh, flying was kind of a nightmare yesterday for some of our people who flew in and, and trying to come in this morning as well. Uh, so with the virtual audience, uh, did they have any questions out there? Because we just want to welcome all um, 45 people in the virtual audience. That's, uh, that's the number I got from Ramon. Thank you. 48. 48. Oh, they're just coming in one by one. So if you would um, pull out your packet that you received, um, the lavender packet. We have the agenda. It's pretty short and quick. Um, so we're going to do a quick overview of the project and then um, give you an opportunity to talk about how this might work in your districts. We also have a uh, handout 
that has the, um, the letterheads for each of the respective organizations, the instructional leadership core project description. And this is really kind of the heart of the project. On the right-hand side, um, we're gonna go over some of the key areas. So there's a slide that shows the four domains and then the instructional leadership core ILC uh, timeline for this first year and then some contact information for you so that if you have questions, you know who to contact. So I'm gonna start with the, the project description. Um, I, I think you've been hearing from Dean and Linda um, and also the media. There's a, there was an article in the LA Times about the ILC. Um, tomorrow, um, there's going to be a uh, EdSource, if any of you subscribe to EdSource, uh, there will be an article about the ILC. We had a conference call about an hour ago with um, some media folks who uh, called in and asked questions and wanted to know more about the ILC. So the media is getting, um, the ILC is drumming up interest uh, out in the community and also uh, through the media. So first of all, uh, uh, on the uh, project description, um, it's, it's important for you to know that um, CTA is taking a, a real big step in uh, approving a set of eight goals or focus for their strategic plan. And a lot of that is gonna be focused on the student and hence our involvement in this project because it only makes sense that for us as educators to go forward with what we're doing, it's important to bring our students along. So the focus on students and what's happening in that transition to the Common Core with some of these key shifts, and I say it with an F to make sure that we understand that these are key shifts that are happening with our kids and our teachers because some of the changes that our teachers are going to be having to adapt is taking that curricular content to a much deeper level than what they have been used to in the last 13 years. So the um, professional development workshops that our ILC members are going to be presenting, uh, you know, we had several requests for, can you just give us a script on what we're supposed to say? So, you know, what that says to me is that they've been schooled in the pacing guides and the scripted learning process. And we purposely stayed away in the professional development training that we provided for our ILC members for them to tune in to what their schools and what their districts need. So there isn't a script. It's really about what the districts need in order to move forward with bringing their students along in this career and college readiness goal of the Common Core State Standards. So we're growing this ILC and all of the professional development um, a little bit at a time. So it isn't like, you know, Jack and a Beanstalk and the uh, stock grows and grows and grows. Um, this is gonna be growing one little bit at a time so that um, our teachers are gonna be proficient in what they're doing and our students are gonna benefit from what the teachers know and understand that students need to do uh, in their education and also in teaching and learning. So um, if you have any questions after you look through the description, um, you know, we will have a, a question and answer period. We'll also have a table talk discussion. And if you, you, know, you raise any of these questions at the end, we will be glad to answer them. But um, the, the description here is pretty, pretty well explanatory in terms of what, what, the student, what the teachers in your district are going to be expected to do. They are going to get a stipend in the first year for the uh, two professional developments and the two follow-ups that they're going to be doing this year. So with that, I want to, if I can get my computer going, um, talk you through the uh, four domains that we're asking um, our ILC members to cover when they're, that's the only, one of the only things that we're asking them to do uh, in their presentations. 
uh, for the professional development workshops that they're doing. And we're calling it the four domains. Um, I need some help. It's on my computer, but it's not on the screen, right? This happens with the shift to Windows or Microsoft 8. So these four domains that you're uh, looking at, and you also have a handout, um, really focuses on the Common Core, what they're about, and the Smarter Balance Assessments. So Common Core and what they're about, and smarter, plus Smarter Balance Assessments and what they are about equals student success. So we put the students at the top of the domain because we're not, um, we're not expecting student, all students to be able to do the same thing at the same time. So knowing who your students are and tending to their specific learning styles, these are the things that our teachers are gonna become more and more aware of. And then in terms of the instructional piece, the pedagogy of learning, Bloom's taxonomy, depth of knowledge, and again, I say depth, and not death, and I just, uh, I always have to emphasize that because um, I'm a first language learner, so Chinese was my first language, and I didn't speak English until I started school, and um, there's no such thing as a PTH in the Chinese language, so sometimes my enunciation doesn't quite come out uh, so I just want to make sure that we understand that these are depth of knowledge and shortened for DOKs. That the DOKs are important to know because they're, they're emphasized in the Smarter Balance assessments. And then when teachers are teaching the content, that having that strong knowledge of content and how to take it deeper into the learning process of our students is also important. That's another common core goal. And the final thing in terms of understanding assessments and how Smarter Balance and what Smarter Balance assesses is that there are four basic claims uh, for each of the targeted areas in English language arts and math. So having an understanding of what those four claims are and incorporating them into their formative and summative assessment process is critical for our students to be successful in not only the common core, but also when the assessments come through the Smarter Balance assessments. So we are calling these the four domains and they're found in the research of the Common Core State Standards and the Smarter Balance assessments. So Anne is going to talk you through the other component of this, which is the, the leadership piece and building the capacity of all of our uh, educators. Thanks, Marlene. Well, welcome, everyone, and thank you for being here. My task this afternoon is very simple. Um, it's simply to describe to you all, um, it's simply to describe to you all some of the resources and the learning opportunities that this project offers to you, your districts, the teachers, and the leaders in your district. And my hope is that after, um, after I just take a few minutes to describe some of these resources and some of these learning opportunities, that then you'll be able to participate in conversation at your tables and with folks in this room and the folks who are participating virtually to think a little bit about how the resources and learning opportunities might help you in your districts with your goals for implementing the Common Core and the Next Generation Science Standards. So 
I'll see if I'm successful in my task. The, um, as, as has been described, the um, ILC project really aims to transform teaching and professional learning in service of enriching the learning experiences for students. And we're attempting to do this in two ways. By building the co individual capacity of teachers in your districts and by site-based leaders in your districts. And secondly, by building the collective instructional capacity that exists in schools. So through various project activities, um, several of which have already begun, and those that will continue over the course of this year and in the next couple of years and beyond, this project is developing our collective knowledge and understanding of what it takes to implement the Common Core and the Next Generation Science Standards. And what this requires, not only of students, but also of teachers, and finally, of all educators who, educational leaders, who are in a position to support teachers to instruct students in the way that best meets the variety of student needs that exist in this state. So this project recognizes that um, the need for learning, um, the need for learning and leadership at all levels of the system. So as Linda described, of course, the student need, learning needs are significant if all students are to achieve the Common Core and the Next Generation Science Standards. And we know that in order for students to achieve this learning, teachers will need to learn as well. They'll need to learn what to teach, how best to teach it, and as Linda so eloquently described, they'll need to learn a lot of this from one another through ongoing professional learning experiences. But of course, in order for teachers to engage continually in ongoing learning in and from their practice, they're going to need to be supported by principals and um, other site-based leaders and district administrators. And those leaders, positional leaders, need to learn also. And so this project um, takes that all into consideration in its design. And this, this picture is intended to be an image of how, over the course of the three years of this project, we're attempting to grow the instructional capacity inside of schools. So we're intending to develop the capacities of schools to become places where students experience deep and meaningful learning every day, and where teachers and leaders are also experiencing rich professional learning Two. Teachers will be um, in the, especially over the course of this year, teachers will be supported to develop new skills and expertise, as well as to support the learning of their peers. And leaders are similarly being supported to learn more about the kinds of conditions that support ongoing professional learning of teachers, because as Linda described, this is new. And they'll also be supported to grow or to enhance these very conditions in their own school sites. In the center of this graphic um, it is a, a picture that shows the, um, the Summer Institute. And beginning with this summer, in summer 2015, the project is going to really begin to focus in on developing site-based leadership teams to guide continuous instructional improvement inside the schools. And um, we're going to do this. Well, let me say a word about the summer institutes, this, the, the regional summer institutes. Um, the intention is for these, um, for the summer institutes to bring together school-based teams that are comprised of site-based leaders as well as teachers. And our expectation is that school teams from schools in your districts, any, any um, school team, um, any school that has an Instructional Leadership Corps member um, is expected to attend the regional summer institutes. And in addition, 
Um, we would like to make this opportunity available to other schools in your district as well. And so it will be open for other school-based teams to attend, particularly um, if there are schools where some teachers or some site-based leaders have attended some of the professional development workshops that we're offering between now and the end of May. We would really like to invite and encourage school teams from those schools to attend the regional summer institutes as well. And um, in years two and three, at the conclusion of the regional summer institutes, in years two and three, support to those school-based teams will continue. So school-based teams will receive ongoing support as they work together to refine their school conditions that support this continuous instructional improvement, much along the lines of how the professional development workshops are unfolding this year, which I'll describe in a minute. And it's really in these ways that the Instructional Leadership Corps, by being at the heart of all of these different learning activities, will help lead the way in developing school-based systems of professional learning that focus on continuous instructional improvement, wise instructional decision making, and the development of robust professional learning communities. So let me say a couple words about what the specific activities are that are happening between now and the end of the summer. So you also have this picture in your packet as well, but you can see that um, there are a series of professional development workshops that are being offered this year. Instructional Leadership Corps members, both teacher members and site-based leadership members, have designed and are now in the process of facilitating these professional development workshops for teachers and then um, professional development workshops for site-based leaders. And those who attend these professional development workshops are receiving support in designing either instructional shifts or what we're calling instructional leadership shifts, which are focused on actually taking action in workplace context to build support for teachers' continuous learning. And by design, the attendees at either, either type of professional development workshops are then expected to go back to either their classroom or to their workplace context and to enact either the instructional shifts or the instructional leadership shifts and to collect up artifacts of what happens when they enact these and bring those back to a second session of the professional development workshop. And it's at this second session where they're going to have an opportunity to examine what happened in conversation with colleagues, to reflect on what worked, what didn't quite work as well as they want, and then together collectively to design the particular next steps that they need to make when they return to their classrooms or when they return to their, their school sites to continue to support ongoing learning. And this is very much what Linda was describing as this is not um, a quick process. It's slow and it will develop over time and through trying things out and continuing to examine what worked and refine those and bring those, and bring those back and make new changes. You'll also see on this timeline that there's um, something, uh, the star marks a learning from the field conference. And the idea here is that all of the ILC members, and you all are invited here because you have ILC members in your district, they're also being supported in a similar manner to develop their facilitation of professional learning for their peers. So after the first round of professional development workshops, all ILC members are coming back together in February, and at that time, they are going to bring their experiences of how their professional development for workshops went. They're going to bring artifacts of enacting those professional development workshops to share with other ILC members and to talk about what was successful and to talk about how they can refine the second round of professional development workshops to make them more successful for teachers or site-based leaders who attend. And I should also say that the professional development workshops, many of which are being offered in your districts, are open to the same group of teachers or site-based leaders to attend both sessions if they want, or can be new members who come in to attend those sessions. Um, and then, as the slide suggests, 
after the second round of professional development workshops, um, which will conclude in May, then there are the summer institutes that I briefly described for the, for the school-based teams. So I think that's all I want to say about this um, at the moment. And now what I'd like to do is, with this brief overview of the project and an explanation of some of the project resources, Primarily, the ones I've talked most about are the Instructional Leadership Corps members who are in your districts who are learning an enormous amount through this project, as well as some of the other learning opportunities that are available to teachers and site-based leaders in your districts. I'd like to give you an opportunity to talk with folks at your table or um, for our virtual audience to use Poll Everywhere and to talk with other virtual attendees about how these resources and learning opportunities might help your district to meet your particular goals for implementing the Common Core and the Next Generation Science Standards. And I think when you have this conversation, some of you have probably already begun to engage in this. And for some of you, this is the first time that you're hearing about this project. So you're just trying to make sense of what it is. But as you begin to have this conversation, I think it will be helpful for you to also think about what steps your district might be able to take to be able to use these resources and, these, and to engage in these learning opportunities and to also think about what the project might be able to do to help you to be able to take these steps, OK? So I'd like to um, give you some time, five or eight minutes or so, to just be in conversation with those of you who are at the table. And some of the ILC project coordinating team members will circulate around to help answer some of your questions and to be in conversation with you. And then we can open it up for a whole group conversation and ask questions and, um, and see where the needs lie. OK?
pieces or for head yeah. yeah, yeah, so. That's, well, it, I, I actually didn't say that specifically because we're not positive yet. The, and the plan was to do four, one for each region, and that probably will be the plan. But, you know, the resources and money and logistics and, you know, and what's that? I'm talking about PTA regions. We have no regions. Yeah, <laughs> it's your region. <laughs> yeah, no, it's your region. Yeah. You're talking about with teachers in your, yeah. Yep. So the question that you're wrestling with is actually um, probably where a lot of people are and seems like it's a natural starting place, right? It's providing the time and the space and getting the bodies, <laughs> right? Um, so, you know, what you were describing was nice if it works that way, that there are set aside days that could actually, this professional learning experience could be put into days that are already set aside. And it sounds like that's what you have on January 21. Right, and so I imagine that that's another question, or it might be a question for the for the second workshop. You know, I mean, that's another. So any sort of thoughts or thinking that you have about that, I think it's probably worth. Either, either, 
and the 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 um, the rationale or the conception is that enacting these instructional leadership shifts in your classroom and then bringing back the learning and then looking at what happens and then thinking about oh what do I need to do next that that is a process that by year two we'd like these school-based teams to be supporting teachers to do that as part of the daily operation of teaching and learning so if there are teachers who want to attend the whole second session and design a second instruction a second shift and enact it in their classroom and exactly that's fine but if they if, if the good news gets out that you know um, teachers who attend the first one say you know actually this is really helpful and I wasn't thinking about this in these ways and then having my colleagues maybe the word gets out and so ideally new people will come in some will come back and new people will come in so so the attendees at both the professional development workshop session is open invitation. So there's no application process. It's open, in, op, open invitation. And what I have said to lots of the ILC members is, you know, the, the, the request is to work with 100 people over the course of this year so that that's how we get the numbers that Linda talked about that are so ma massive. But there's nothing the matter with starting very small. So the question, the logistical question that you were raising, you know, is if the teacher in your district and her partner, if they could work with, you know, teachers from one or two schools and they only work with a small number, that's this fine. That's, that's fine. Yeah. And then the second one attracts more people and the, and the goal is to get to 100. And so if it works best in your region to do three of these sessions and work with 25, 30 people at a time, that's fine, or a couple schools. So it's whatever works for you. So what's happening with us is we're getting all 100 of our elementary teachers. Right, and that's fine too. So then will we still go ahead and do the second one or two other ones? Absolutely. Or, or you can also, there may be other people that want to, that's fine. But that's okay. I mean, you can spread the word. But, but exactly. Then and then whoever comes back, yeah. Because the um, the intention is that in the summer institute um, that will attract teachers. Ideally, that will attract school-based teams who've had teachers or leaders who have attended these. If they have a team, but by but then the model shifts instead of that sort of the, the two sort of visions there's instruct there's individual capacity building which is what's happening up the first year and then beginning in the summer it's really team capacity building we continue to support obviously individuals need to have capacity to teach that way or to lead that way but the notion is that it's really a team effort and that's what we know is going to you know schools need to do this together and districts need to support schools in doing that what con that, that's a great question. A different question. Um, what constitutes a team are teachers and site-based leaders. Principals are key. And no hard and fast number, although five to seven is a good um, size. Bigger than seven is, um, and I'll say that, bigger than seven tends to be unwieldy. And you have to deal with status differences and lots of things. Some people are more, right? I mean, look, some people are much more experienced in working that way, and others just don't know how to begin. But when I've done this work with teams in the past, that's really critical. So three to seven is fine. Five is sort of ideal. They're different. And, and then the rule of thumb in terms of who's on a team should be a third administrators, two-thirds teachers. There's no you know, rule, but that would be like a rule of thumb. Mm -hmm. And then you have a different question. Well, yeah, there's another one. Mm -hmm. Summer Institute is a, is a PTA summer. This is different. Is different. This is different. And I, yeah, that. and that's like my, the yeah. Summer so Institute could have an ILC component to it. That's why I'm right. And, and, and I think part of the vision, I mean, a potential vision or possibility would be that that's what the CPA institutes might become in years going forward, but not this year. It's different. It's going to be different. It's an ILC institute, regionally based, and um, the teacher that you mentioned from your district will be, you know, hopefully supported. 
to bring a team from her school and then ideally there'll be a couple of one other or two other school teams who attend the workshops that want to come also because that way you begin to grow the capacity in your in your district does that make sense Does it help so what what are the new problems now what are the challenges now as, as that gets explained for actually Right. Right. And give them an avenue to get the word out, right? And to right and to help them and to get spread the information to folks and to make sure that, you know, and particularly I think it's critical for principals to be enough in the know about what this is. And because it's not scripted, it's not this one shift, right? There's the opportunity, um, I think, for the teachers that are leading the workshops to also be in conversation with um, the CNI department in the in the district and with principals about okay what are the biggest learning right CNI yeah what are the biggest learning needs that we have what shall we really focus on what are our oh so that's lovely Right, right. Any other questions? Yeah, and so what the professional development workshop should look like, what the components of it should be, is both being able as attendees at the workshop to experience what it, what one of these shifts are, and then to begin to think about with this shift as a model, does this shift make sense in my classroom with my kids given what I teach? And if the answer is, well, no, not really, then what's a shift that would make sense? So there's an opportunity to get support in actually designing that shift and then enacting it back in their classroom and then seeing how does it go. And the shift is intended to be small. It's intended to be something that you can do in one or two class periods, right? Really small. Um, and then bring that experience back. In, and they'll get support in the first professional development workshop about what it might be that they would bring back based on the shift that they're going to enact. Okay, and they have a little bit of that modeled for them, just like Jeannie did for you guys. And then um, they bring those artifacts back, and then there's an opportunity to look at, okay, so what did we do? If everyone's doing something similarly, if it's all science-based, I mean, there's lots of different iterations. You can kind of imagine the design for how you'd organize that. But what did we do? How did it go? What evidence do we have that something worked well? What didn't work well? And what do we think that we need to do next? Based on that. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, no, that's session two of PD workshop one. So that was the other piece that people had to kind of swallow, is that it's not a one-time workshop, but it's a, con it's a consecutive. And so ideally, um, the workshop would have, ideally, the space between those two sessions would not be really far apart, right? So that you can actually, you know, so that you care about looking at the stuff that you did because it's not three months ago, you know, to do something different with it. Yeah, so there's the ideal vision. So the ideal vision is exactly what you said. 
but what's really practical in the first year is I don't really think that most people will do that. But I think that the people that say, hey, we want support in this, what they'll do is they'll get some of their colleagues to come to the second one, and they'll start talking to their principal, and they'll start saying, okay, the Summer Institute, let's get a team of us, because we need to learn how to build the conditions in our school so that we can do just what you said. Let's come and learn how to do that. And then ideally, districts like yours will say, you know what, we don't just want this in the one lone school. We want to help support several teams to come to this so that they can be doing this. And then in years two and three of the project, folks like you will say, okay, now we want to get together with other district leaders to talk about how we can support the multiple schools that we have inside, right? I mean, you sort of see how it's, that's in my head. <laughs> Yeah, well, so one of the things that we'll talk about at the Learning from the Field Conference is how to support the ILC members in just what we've talked about. Just that the opportunities for messaging are far and few between. <laughs> and so, um, so yes, uh, you know, uh, that will be that will be sort of the next. I think it would be a good approach to tell them that there's an opportunity to continue this kind of work and for schools that want support and how to do this. And if you've got all the teachers coming, I mean, I think it would be great if district folks talk to all the principals and said, you know, give them the vision and what the opportunity is and begin to seed the idea. And who would you want, who would be good on your team? And how would you, how would you open up, you know? Yes, this is the next time they meet, yes. Yes. Um, there are a few, but um, I think the people who are in the ILC conference got decided before, and so that's yeah. So there's an overlap. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it might be you know a piece to seed in. Yeah, he's a science teacher, right? I remember him from the ILC. He's, yeah, he's great. Sure. Mm -hmm. What do you think? I just engaged him in this conversation and it's really a lot of sense making about what the, what the project is and how people could engage in it. So that was good for one table. So this, I walked away from this table, but they were having the same problem. So maybe, should I um, just give an announcement about like just a couple more minutes and then we'll take questions? Or what do you think? Yes? Yes. Okay, I can hear that um, conversations are right in the middle. So this is just a couple minute warning. If you can continue to problem solve and troubleshoot or get your questions that you've got, and then in two minutes I'll call us all together and we'll talk as a group. And, same goes for our virtual attendees. Okay. good question um, and also you all should have received a letter about the project did you all not receive that I did. you did okay
it seems like now is probably be a good time to invite whole group conversation. So I'm curious, I think it would be, um, as I went around to a couple of the different tables, I heard um, lots of different kinds of questions. Um, many of them were logistical, which makes complete sense. Um, some of them were around just trying to understand what really is the offering, what really are the resources and the professional um, learning opportunities that are being offered um, as you began to grapple with it. So there was a lot of sense making going on. And I don't, I'm going to reserve saying a few things and just I'd like to hear from you all about if there was a question that came up that you were stumbling with that you couldn't make sense of or if you actually already have a way that you're imagining using these resources and uh, learning opportunities in your district. I think a couple of concrete examples would be really, really helpful for people, even if you haven't worked everything out yet. Jane? Ideas. This is from the virtual audience, and one of the ideas that was shared is utilizing the expertise of the ILC teacher um, as, a, as a resident consultant to work with their PLCs um, in transitioning to Common Core. So that was one of the things that they saw as a possibility. Oh, interesting. So taking the, taking the, the knowledge that resides in the human resource and thinking about how to leverage that resource strategically um, and partner that with other structures that are already in place to build the learning. That makes a lot of sense. Any, can someone else give us an example of how they're imagining they might be able to use this? Yeah. Mm-hmm. They, th their vision for working is to tap into the BTSA program, the BITSA program, and working with both support providers and the beginning teachers to be a resource for looking at the instructional shifts at, at the base level. Great. So particularly for teachers who are newly entering the profession. Right. That, is that what I heard? But also the support providers. And the support providers. So you're kind of getting it from, you're kind of attacking it from both ends. That's nice. That's a nice example. So again, I hear an example of a structure that's already in place that's designed to support prof ongoing professional learning and how to marry the learning opportunities from this project with that structure. Do, do you all want to share your example that you were talking about, about how, to, how you might use it? Science. Yeah, in, in the, well, in the district, I was thinking. Oh. I think if you could talk about the logistics a little. Okay, that um, in our district, um, we've got district training days set aside. And um, we're going to take two of those days. Um, my partner does math, and I do science. So she's going, we're, we're going to do the shifts presentation in the beginning and then we're going to split off into two rooms and we're going to have the math presentation in one room and the science presentation in another and, and demonstrate a shift and then um, and, you know bring them back the next time and have them bring back results and then what we were talking about doing after that is getting our teams maybe formed in that second session uh, of meetings and have teams come for that and start working on that towards the summer institute Okay, great. So that's the idea of using... But you know, he's a tiny little district. Yeah, Amador County. I got all 100 <laughs> elementary teachers in Adaptive Audience. So. That's right. So there, when you're small, you can do a lot more. And uh, Jeff is from Lodi Unified. So the, just so you know where the examples are and you can contact them. Amador, Amador County Office of Education. Okay, and so that was an example of being able to use days that are set aside already for professional learning. Um, and so that makes a lot of sense if that works. And then I'm wondering what other sort of ideas folks came up with, particularly if that's not going to work in your district. Um, 
I'm an ILC member also. Uh, we're working with a team that's composed of a couple of teachers from my district, which is Lenox down by the LA airport, and then a couple of teachers from Inglewood, which is the next district up to the north. Um, in Lenox, we've got kind of regular PD scheduled already built into the schedule on, on Wednesdays. And so we've talked to the district uh, about letting us use one of those Wednesdays. So that's a, a pretty easy fit. Inglewood doesn't have that structure. So what they're planning on doing is actually a Saturday session for teachers there and trying to convince the district to maybe you know chip in a very small stipend or something like that or you know food or just something to, to make that a little bit more appealing to people coming in on a Saturday. So same session basically, but depending on the district, trying to find different ways to fit it into their schedules. Okay, so a different sort of organizing principle for how to bring people there. Were there any um, problems? Um, oh, go ahead. Um, right, right now, um, our curriculum director has a group of us, there's three of us working on writing next generation science lessons for the elementaries. Um, she's talked to us about next year, we're a STEM school, she wants our school to kind of become a lab school. Mm -hmm. So we're going to start teaching the lessons we write next year to see how they work. Um, so maybe one idea is to start bringing teachers into those lab schools and, and seeing the actual things in action. So that's nice. So there's a whole set of um, creative examples about how to build capacity for this kind of instruction and instructional leadership nested inside of schools and districts. I mean, that's what I'm hearing. And I guess before we, um, before we sort of get ready to conclude, I'm wondering if there were any problems that sat at your tables that felt like an impediment and you didn't know how to solve them, and I'm wondering if a couple of those because maybe there's a solution about how to attack that sort of problem in the room or um, virtually. Well, I think uh, one of the things we talked about is for the three of us that was very new to us today. Mm -hmm. We didn't have a lot of background. We haven't met with our ILC members. So um, we didn't have some of the connections that I think other people may have had. So a lot of what we have to do is go back and research and figure out kind of exactly what is it now. Okay, so that's, and you're not alone, so I heard that conversation at some other tables too, so I'm glad you brought it up. Any, any sort of thinking in the room about how to manage that? You said to go back and do a little bit of research, but like being even more concrete, like specifically, how, how can we make this happen? Because the teachers are being asked to do something that's really different, right? And so very different inside of a district. Uh, one suggestion we had was if we could get a list of the teams that have been formed, in our regions and area to see where the expertises are so that we can start sharing this information to set up workshops if they haven't happened already. But we don't even know who is in which districts and what teams are set up yet. So having a list would be very helpful. Okay. So getting the, the list of the list of the people and the expertise. Jane? So uh, a similar uh, request or several of the same ideas came up in the online session. And one of the things that we um, redirected them is in the handouts in your folder is that who to contact list mm -hmm. and it's also obviously on the online um, ones and so that gives people a first cut um, at least of somebody to contact in their area who can help them find out all the teams because um, that's also helpful just to have contacts there. That's great. The, the other thing I'll say um, is you know as district as district leaders you know to think about how these opportunities can be used to help you advance whatever your goals are so you've got professional learning goals or needs that you've recognized that you've already set the course for how can this be woven in to amplify what it is that you're already doing Norma? so so that was something we discussed here too so that let's say an ILC member has an idea for a workshop and then the staff already went through a similar workshop a month previous. So there needs to be that uh, communication yep. and um, synchrony that happens. Mm -hmm. I think another great suggestion from this table was potentially sharing the launch materials mm -hmm. and so what the ILC members went through and so that they're familiarized with what the ILC members already have done and, and been a part of. Okay, that's great. That's great. Yeah. Uh, oh, it's coming. Thank you. Just uh, briefly, we'd love to have the dates of all the institutes, particularly the summer institutes, as soon as possible. To help for planning. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any, anything else? Any other questions or? 
I just wanted to point out that uh, some of what you've heard uh, as far as the collaboration is concerned uh, happened because the chapter president uh, has a relationship with the district. So when Mike talked about um, the uh, lab situation, that's, that was a conversation that he as president of his union have had with the district and they plan together just as uh, Jeff Johnston from Lodi is a chapter president and has had that conversation uh, with his district about the, the individuals that have been involved in the ILC and what needs to happen. So I think it's really important that uh, the collaboration between the union and the district uh, having this dialogue and having their own vision of what it looks, what it's gonna look like in their district to also not have it interfere with something that's already started in the district and how it might blend and add to what they're currently doing. So I, I've heard some of those conversations um, in, not only through emails that, um, where these questions have been asked, but also amongst you today. So I think that building that relationship, um, moving forward in, in terms of building those partnerships, uh, will only enhance what uh, what you're currently doing. And O'Brien oh, too is also a chapter president who also helped, um, you know, had those dialogues with their district to start um, these types of plans. He's been doing it for several years now, right? And also Brian is one of our um, <coughs> regional ILC advocates. Um, what we did was in the uh, out of the 184 people, we identified 12 people to take to a training uh, with the Student um, Achievement Partners. Uh, this is a group of people who um, were instrumental in developing the Common Core State Standards, and they started this uh, free nonprofit group called Student Achievement Partners, where there's a, a, a lot of resources on their website to assist teachers and uh, leaders in implementing the Common Core. So they started a training program for what they call core advocates. And they take them through an intense training of content in either English language arts or math. And then they train them to also be advocates um, and good consumers about the common core. So Brian is one of the um, team members who will be assisting uh, people in region three, which is the LA area, uh, and support them with the common core work. Great, thanks Marlene. So I guess just to, to underscore what Marlene was suggesting is that this project is really an approach to the professional learning. And so it is really critical that it support the vision that already exists in your district for where those needs are. And so I think that's a really useful way to think about what the opportunities are that the project um, provides as well as um, the projects connected to a lot of the other smarter balanced assessment work that's going on in the state. And so there's other resources that just um, accrue to folks that are involved in the project just through those relationships. Yeah. Two, two questions kind of came out of the conversation that we had at our table with some help from Vernon over there. Um, <coughs> one is the issue of time especially time for chapter leaders, site leaders, to um, begin engaging, engaging the dialogue. And I'm wondering if the project is going to have any sort of grant offerings that districts can apply for, chapters can apply for, beyond the ILC participants that would facilitate growth of the project. That's the first question, and then I'll, I'll go to my second one after. Um, Jeff, the first one off the top of my head is... Um, <clears throat> A foundation that CTA has, IFT, um, they provide grants for teachers, either individual teachers, uh, an entire group of teachers, but the amount uh, is from $5,000 to $20,000. And this is um, this fund is uh, funded out of their, you know, your the teachers' dues go into a pot of money for this Institute for Teaching. So within the organization, there is um, that pot of money. And then at the NEA level, there's a similar one. Um, the, somebody, the National Foundation for Improvement in Education. And that's another uh, chunk of money that 
uh, your NEA dues dollars go towards supporting teachers in uh, uh, teaching and learning and professional development. And then you can do what we did, apply for these large sums of money. That's great. And then the other thing that I'll say, and it kind of goes back to the point about um, the union presidents and the districts working closely together to think about and having a shared and in common vision, is um, that in the process of doing that, being able to build the capacity for professional learning, um, the provision of professional learning to also be housed within the district itself is an enormous resource that um, you know, can the, there's monies that are available for paying for outside professional development um, that don't necessarily can can be sort of reallocated or rethought over time. Maybe not in the immediate future. Um, I also just want to mention the LCFF funding, and mm -hmm. just to remind everybody that in the in the LCFF funding there are eight priority areas. One of those is standards teaching and helping students um, understand the standards and teaching the standards or transitioning to the new standards. For this year, the LCFF plan was already submitted, but it can be renewed annually. And your, your districts, everyone in this room could re-examine their LCFF plan or their LCAP plan as to how they're spending their LCFF funds. So that's another possibility of uh, shifting some funds from the LCFF allocations that they have and revise their LCAP um, template. Right, that's a very good point. Any other questions or problems that came up that you have no idea how to approach or? All right. <laughs> Not while you're on camera. <laughs> Oh, we're on camera. All right. Well, then let's um, let's bring the let's bring the formality to a close, um, so <coughs> folks can get going that need to go, and so that people who have burning questions that they want to ask in a few minutes they can. <laughs> How's that? Is that yeah? Okay. Oh, what am I supposed to be doing? Oh, you know, I think in, in just so you know who the rest of the um, coordinating group is, um, this grant is, of course, uh, coordinated through Stanford, so they're the fiscal agent for the grants. But I also want you to know who has been working on putting together all of this work on the ILC. Uh, since Stanford is the fiscal agent, uh, the director of the uh, SCOPE, Center is John Snyder. <laughs> so John Snyder is uh, one of the key players, and then Ann Jakewith is the assistant director of SCOPE. The National Board Resource Center is Linda Bald. And so this is our Stanford group. We have one person who is really a key player. She's the coordinator of the project, but she's at a family um, uh, excursion right now in Canada, so it was already pre-planned and she couldn't be here with us, but it's Melissa Gilbert, um, who is the coordinator of this project. So from the CTA uh, side, we have um, the IPD department, or Instruction and Professional Development Department, from each of the regions. So uh, Norma Sanchez is from Region 3. Uh, Vernon Gatone is from Region 1, which is from Eureka all the way down to Salinas on the, on the uh, ocean side of the state. And Jane Robb is right now temporarily serving as the Region 4 um, staff person. We have a new person coming on board in January, and her name is Karen Taylor, and she'll be servicing the Region 4 area. And then I service Region 2, the interior part of the state, from Reading all the way down to Bakersfield, right? <laughs> so I just want you to know, um, also we have a manager of the uh, Instruction and Professional Development Department, and that's Justo Robles, who's serving double duty as the IPD manager and also the human rights manager. So did I get everybody who's been working on this project? Okay, so that's, uh, so to put a face on who you're going to be dealing with, and then on the flip side of that contact list are the uh, 12 core advocates, uh, three per region. 
Um, any questions? Otherwise, we don't have to keep you here until three o'clock. Um, and with this rain, I think it's a good idea to get on the road. So thank you very much. We'll, but we'll hang around if you have individual questions.